Forgive me, Father. Never fit in that. Never get in that at all. This is more like it. Now, what's the whitest thing you know? Whiter than the driven snow, whiter than the whites of your eyes? Sugar. Non-integrated, non-black, sweet sugar. But you see, there is a black man in your sugar. His name is Norbert. Rillier. Norbert Rillier in uh, 18... in 1846 invented a vacuum pan that revolutionized the sugar refining industry. Now, you have to dig to find that fact. I mean, it's not much history, but it's still history. Now, uh, what do you stand in? In your shoes. Now, there's just you and your shoes, isn't it? Nope. See, there's uh, a black man standing in your Oxfords with you. Sharing your soul and your heel is a man, his name is Jan Ernst Metzeliger. And in 1863, this is a drawing by the kids, Metzeliger invented the machine that made mass-produced shoes possible. Now, you have to dig around for that fact, too. And again, it's not much history, but it's history. Am I coming in clear to uh, California? I mean, is this TV signal driving through a pass in the Sierra Nevada mountains and slipping into San Francisco? Okay, well, I want to thank you, Jim Beckworth. Jim Beckworth out of St. Louis, hunter, trapper, and honorary chief of the Crow tribe of Indians. We had trouble finding you, Jim. Though you helped open the West, you didn't make the books. Chicago, right here, where the Wrigley Building is young fellow by the name of Jean-Baptiste de Sable. Jean-Baptiste, he founded you, Chicago, when he traded with the Indians. And of course, there it is right there at that particular time. It was called a Chicago or Stinking Onion by the Indians. And de Sable, he didn't even change the name at all. Now you take the Lewis and Clark expedition here, right in there, you'll find a black man named York, helping to open the West. Those men are trying to wash the black out of York. That's what you might call historically significant because a lot of people think we ought to wash white, but we ain't gonna, you see. Texas, coming to you, Texas, right down the Chisholm Trail, right here. Right down there with 5,000 black cowboys who never made it to the Hollywood West. Did you know that, huh? In the same group, there was one black outlaw. His name was Deadwood Dick who claimed his soul brothers were Bat Masterson, Billy the Kid, and Jesse James. Did what Dick used to ride into the saloon, order two drinks, one for himself and one for his horse. And here's his horse a drinking a shot of red eye with a straw. And how about the 186,000 blacks who fought on the Union side during the Civil War? 38,000 died. How about Teddy Roosevelt's charge up San Juan Hill? It wasn't just the Rough Riders who made it. Four black regiments went right up with Teddy. They didn't get lost going up the hill. They got lost in the history books. How about the North Pole? Snow White? Well, the first man there was black, Matthew Henson. He spoke Eskimo. 
And uh, he was Admiral Perry's navigator. And although he made it first to the pole, it never quite made it to the history books. And how about your heart? Can we get there? All right. Daniel Hale Williams first performed open heart surgery successfully. Now, this list could go on forever. Blacks who made it, blacks who made history, but who didn't get into the history text at all? And the strange thing is how little there is about us in the textbooks. Napoleon once said history is a fable agreed upon, and the fable agreed upon up to now is that American history is white on white. But sometimes we did get into the history books. All wrong. Now you take this one. The Growth of the American Republic, 1942 edition. Samuel Eliot Morrison, Henry Steele Cummager. Quote, as for. This has to do with uh, slavery. As for Sambo, Sambo, Professor Morrison, Sambo, Professor Cummager, as for Sambo, whose wrongs moved the abolitionists to wrath and tears, there is some reason to believe that he suffered less than any other class in the South from its peculiar institution. Peculiar institution means slavery. Although brought to America by force, the incurably optimistic Negro soon became attached to the country and devoted to his white folks." Unquote. Those lines were written by two Pulitzer Prize winning white Northern professors. Slavery, that's the place everybody likes to start Negro history. You have ignorant black men being brought over from African chains. Terrible thing, slavery. But this way slavery is taught, it sort of takes the sting out of it. Because the way it's usually taught, people think that we Afro-Americans started with nothing but little grass skirts like the cats in the Tarzan movies. And though America gave us slavery, America kindly gave us religion and a lick or two of education. And when we get more jobs and more education, then up from slavery. But uh, we had something before we left Africa, something more than rhythm. I mean, we had a high culture. The culture was so high that uh, great artists in the world are still borrowing from it. Now, here's a sculpture by an unknown African artist. And here's what Paul Clay took from him. Now here's a work by an unknown black African, and Pablo Picasso liked what he saw. Another African design, and Modigliani swiped it, or he was influenced by it, or whatever polite word you want to use. Another black African artist, and Picasso didn't change it very much. I mean, when you look at this copying, you gotta give us a little more than rhythm. You gotta give us style. Now, if you tell the history of slavery right, you got a big problem on your hands. The slave trader didn't take some savage out of Africa. He took a human being. He sold him like an animal and separated him from his family. America invented the cruelest slavery in the history of the world because it broke up black families. After slavery was over, America kept breaking up the black man's family. And that's some awful history to teach. Now, if you want to look history right straight in the eye, you're going to get a black eye. Because it isn't important whether a few black heroes got lost or stolen or strayed in America's history textbooks. What's important is why they got left out. Now, this country has got a psychological history. There was a master race, and there was a slave race. And though there isn't any political slavery anymore, those same old attitudes have hung around. I mean, the burning part of burn, baby, burn, is right here in this classroom. We want to thank Mrs. Lovely Billups and the whole gang here at fourth grade for the brilliant and intelligent artwork that uh, 
they've done here to make this whole broadcast sing. I want you guys to keep pretending that I'm not here. You're doing a great job and just uh, keep on drawing and reading and writing and doing what you have to do because I'm going to talk about some other kids. Not you, Mary, John, and Bob. These are kids from other schools. Uh, did you know in some states it used to be against the law to teach blacks to read or write? Nowadays, we're getting these integrated school rooms, and most people think that if we get enough teaching and enough jobs, everything is going to take care of itself. But there is a scar of history running right through kids as young as these. It tears you up if you know how to look at drawings kids make, because kids shouldn't know much about history and anything about discrimination. I mean, nobody hates little black kids, but why do some of them cause so much trouble? And if you ask black and white children to draw themselves, or trees, or houses, some strange things happen. We ask some ordinary white kids from ordinary families to make some drawings for us. Like, well, let's call him John. John's white, and we asked him to draw himself. This is John. This is his house, and this is his tree. Then we asked a black kid, let's call him Ralph, to do the same thing. This is Ralph's drawing of himself. This is his tree. Now, why should two kids of the same age draw so differently? Enter the expert. This is Dr. Emanuel Hammer, psychiatrist specializing in children's therapy. Well, let me illustrate it for you. Let's take these drawings. No matter what a child draws, he's really picturing himself. Ask a secure child to draw a tree, and he's likely to draw a bountiful spreading tree. A black child drew this tree, cut off in its growth, stark, bare, ungratified. It works the same way with drawings of people. Normal children, average drawings. The mood is happy, the child feels capable, the drawings are complete, and the arms are developed to emphasize strength. These children were old enough to draw complete figures. The significant fact is what they left out. Arms, hands. A child may sense that a situation in life is so powerless that he himself is equivalent to an armless man. My own study reveals that armless people appear three times more frequently in the drawings by black children than those by white. The faceless beings suggest that these youngsters not only feel themselves to be less than they might be, they don't even feel themselves to be. The black child who is forced to live in a hostile world may disappear in self-defense. He drifts through life feeling like a shadow. He stops caring and he stops trying. A child who has this on his mind cannot be a child. A child who has this on his mind could want to burn down cities when he gets older. The whole confusion was summed up by a black nine-year-old in these two paintings. This is a nine-year-old boy who draws a white man, Robin Hood maybe. And this is how the same boy draws himself. And this is the consequence of deformed history. Linda, close the curtains. Brian, lower the screen. Bonnie, lights, please. In the past 50 years, 33,000 feature films have been made in the United States, and about 6,000 of them have had parts for black actors. For the most part, the black portraits have been drawn by white writers, white producers, and white directors for a white audience. Most black parts were the way white Americans wanted them to be. The black male was consistently shown as nobody, nothing. He had no qualities that could be admired by any man, or more particularly, any woman. When the sun goes down, the tide goes down, the dark and cats around and they all begin to shout. Hey, hey, Uncle Doug did speak to White people didn't like to think much about them. Sort of like a relative, uh, you got in a rest home. I mean, happy darkies, dancing and singing was all they wanted to hear about. Being good Christians, the whites out front like to think the blacks out back were kind of happy. Uncle Tom's Cabin was one of the first movies made that tried to say anything about black people. Uncle Tom was changed a little each time it was put on the stage and all the parts were played by white actors. And by the time they made a movie of it in 1903, Uncle Tom was just the white man's idea of a good nigga. You might say he was what H. Rat Brown ate. They made this picture five times. And by the time they finished with it, 
Mickey Rooney could have played Uncle Tom. Minstrel shows started as a black man's entertainment for himself and the plantation owners. When they were filmed, though, they were done by a white cast. You figure that out. They were done as sort of a joke, and the black entertainer couldn't even get a job making fun of himself. The first really vicious anti-Negro film was called The Birth of a Nation, and it was a honey. And the second worst thing about it was that technically, in 1918, it was the best movie that had ever been made. A cat named D.W. Griffith produced it, and he knew how. See? Birth of a Nation pretended to tell the story of the Civil War and what happened afterwards when the slaves were freed. White woman couldn't walk on her own sidewalk if you believe the picture. In the South, Negroes got the right to vote, and the movie showed black vote collectors refusing to accept white votes and black people sneaking in extra votes. And if these black bad guys don't look very bad to you, it's probably because they were white actors wearing burnt cork. Negro legislators took over in the South, and in the film they were made to look like apes. This was the movie version of how it looked in the Southern State Legislature. They drank whiskey. They ate chicken with their hands in the State House. And they put their feet up on the table with the shoes off. And of course, they passed all sorts of crazy laws according to the film like anybody could marry anybody they wanted to. It was obvious to anyone who saw this picture that Negroes weren't fit to govern themselves or anyone else because they really weren't people. This film is 50 years old and it may look silly and out of date now, but it didn't look silly when it was made and seen. Several million Americans who saw it were propagandized to believe that this is the way things would be if they weren't careful. So they've been pretty careful. Colonel Cameron, a former officer in the Confederate Army, is all upset over the way Northerners and the freed slaves are changing his South, taking the mint julep right out of his mouth. So he takes a walk one day while he's worrying about it, and he sees two white kids playing, and then four black kids come along. Being hardly human and naturally afraid of ghosts, the black kids run. Colonel Cameron sees the whole scene, gets his great idea. And with this, that great white all-American organization, the KKK, was born. The cavalry and the bedsheet has come to the rescue. The South is saved. In this picture, the Ku Klux Klan was the good boy who saved the South. Most Hollywood films, though, even the early ones, weren't really nasty. Nobody was sitting around saying, hey, let's take care of the niggas. What producers were doing was making money. And to make money, they made pictures that white ticket buyers would enjoy. They showed Negroes the way most Americans like to think of them. To blame Hollywood is like throwing a rock at the mirror because you don't like what you see in it. Burt Williams was one of the great vaudeville performers. He couldn't get parts in white pictures, so he made a lot of short comedies. He played the part most Americans consider typical Negro. It wasn't bad, really, just lazy, stupid, and happy the way he was. And his feet hurt. He was afraid of most everything. And when he was scared, he shook, and his teeth chattered. Unlike a scared white man, the black man's eyes could pop out of his head. And when he was scared, he was so scared he couldn't talk. And he was also so scared he couldn't run. Black women, on the other hand, were steady and imperturbable. They stood like a rock on the face of things that scared black men. Another strange physical characteristic was when they were really very scared the guys turned white. When you look back on these old films, the patterns come jumping out at you. 
The most consistent thing about them was the attack on the black man. He was never even given the privilege of being a man. He was a boy, as in, you know, here boy. They had a lot of other great qualities besides being cowardly. For instance, they stole chickens. Who's in there? Who's in there? Ain't nobody in here but us chickens. <laughs> they shot craps. That's your papa talking to you now, Dice. Come on. Just, just hit me one more time. And lions weren't the only thing they were afraid of, either. They were afraid of gorillas. Wallace Rose, is that you next to me? Wallace Rose, is that you next to me? Now, come on, Wallace Rose, now, don't stop now. Come on, tell me the truth. Is that you next to me? Wallace Rose, please say yes, that's you. They were also afraid of ghosts and skeletons. Jim? Is that you scratching my head? Jim? Jim! Now, come on, now, what are you looking at? <laughs> What's your hurry, boys? Even when they were little boys, they had these characteristics. Farina and our gang was the boy, boy. The tradition of the lazy, stupid, crap-shooting, chicken-stealing idiot was popularized by an actor named Lincoln Theodore Monroe Andrew Perry. The cat made two million dollars in five years in the middle 30s, and everyone who ever saw a movie laughed at Steppin' Fetch It. Come out, come out, wherever you is, wherever you be, wherever you do. Come out, come out, wherever you am, how's the government looking for you? Way along, stranger! You, you scare somebody stiff like that. I'm looking for hillbillies as you are. I ain't saying I am and I ain't saying I ain't. Well, that's close enough for me, because I'm tired of walking myself. The government told me I got... Bring in a hillbilly, so you come go with me to Washington. I ain't a going. That's the color of another horse. Mm. Well, I tell you, you don't go for me. We go for the Navy. No! I go for the Navy. It's, well, I tell you, go for the Army. No, I won't go for the Army. It's too bad he was as good at it as he was. The character he played was planted in a lot of people's head, and they remember it the rest of their lives as clear as an auto accident. What's that? Are you an Indian? Yes, I'm Indian. Man, you don't know. I got, I'm Indian. I got one fold of Cherokee, two fold Seminole, and... I got four fills of Hiawatha. Wait a minute. Hiawatha was a woman. I can't help it. I got four fifths of her. He played in movies with other actors who were as American as Mom's Raspberry Jello. If they accepted the stereotype, how wrong could it be? Judge Rigby, can I see you some, please? Well, I'm pretty busy. Yes, yeah, but I just want to ask if you cared about it. Care about what? About over at my house. Nightful last. Oh, another baby? Yeah, so you show guests that you heard. What's his name? Oh, we call him L.R. Lars Rigby Livingston. Oh, named him after me, did you? Yes, yeah, Lars Rigby. I told my wife, Ethel, I said, honey, I know Judge Show going to be gratified. Well, of course, that's I appreciate the honor. Yes, yeah, sir. I suppose a compliment, and I ought to do something for you. Yes, yeah, that's what I thought. Cause you come over to my place tomorrow, and I'll give you a job. Job? Rake and leave. All American Little Shirley Temple played a lot of parts that involved her with black actors. She was always real nice to them. Oh, James Henry, you always do it wrong. 
This is an imitation step and fetch it named Willie Best with Shirley. Come on, Miss Bertie. I just won't budge. I'll show them I'm not. The cute little white girl was brave and strong in the face of danger. And the big black man was stupid and cowardly. What are you afraid of them for? Oh, honey child, them Yankees is mighty powerful. They can even change the weather. Yes? Whenever they come around, I never know whether it's winter or summer. I'm shivering and sweating at the same time. Jim Henry, serve these cookies to Master Harold and wipe his chin. Yes, ma'am, Miss Bud. She was good to them, and they were good to her. Sort of a master and pet relationship. How would you like to see Uncle Billy dance? Oh. All right, James, let's get going, son. This is Bill Bojangles Robinson, one of the great ones. But if he wanted to work and dance, he had to come into a picture through the servant's entrance. Shirley was good to children, too. They loved their little mistress, and she treated them real good. Hello, Sally Ann. Just like they were equals. Good morning, Sally Ann. Miss Virgie? Please, ma'am? We all didn't come here to wish him any happy, happy returns. That's it, many happy returns of the day. And we all done made you a darling. Here it is, Miss Bertie. There was more I had to say, but Emmy, I forgot it. <laughs> you said everything, Sally Ann. Don't you worry. This is the very nicest present I got. Thank you ever so much. Yes, indeed, children. It was very thoughtful and sweet. Come now, dear. I'll see you later, and I'll save you some cake. Oh, nice. be waiting. I suppose it might have surprised a lot of Hollywood writers and producers to know a scene like that could actually make a lot of people, mostly black, sick to their stomach. This is a lot of fun, isn't it? Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but... The newsreels that were shown along with feature films knew a good thing when they saw one. They helped keep all the black cats in their place. Nobody black ever did anything very newsy in a newsreel. They did things like eat watermelon in watermelon eating contests. Then another favorite for the newsreel cameraman was to film people throwing things at them. Good sport. Some college football publicity man decided this was a good idea. And they were a lot of very funny golf pictures. If you weren't black, they were funny, I guess. Lie down, lie down, lie down. Just bite out of your mouth. Don't miss, boss, don't miss. <laughs> well, you keep still, see? Otherwise, you'll have flour in your room and you won't smell them. Oh, boy. Oh, wait, hey! Everything suggested the black man was nothing. Hollywood adopted a sort of British attitude toward black natives of other countries. They were always sneaking around the bushes, you know, carrying stuff on the head. White men weren't supposed to get caught sweating. Anne Harding played a scene in a picture called Prestige and it stated the colonial attitude. Don't let it break, Andre. Take to him your race for a wedding gift. The prestige of the white man. That means everything you stand for. And it is the only weapon you two will have. Prestige. But it is enough to preserve you. Yes, sir. And I'll try to remember it. If you'll kiss me. 
Even though most non-white natives of any place were savages in films, it often pleased white producers to endow a few chosen blacks with the virtue of great loyalty to him, the white man. Here's one defending Ann Harding to the death. There was always one loyal and true black man who would do anything for his master. Some of them were wonderful people. You know, if you really get a good one. Mostly, though, Negroes were not heroes. They were a bit part servants. Railroad porters. Watch your steps. Watch your steps, sir. Well, this is your destination, folks. They made very good chauffeurs. Look good in their caps. Good morning, Colonel, sir. And they were great at serving all Man, kinds of drinks. That coffee of yours stays with you like poor relation. Or says you got the hell of your sassiest tea. Wherever there was a thirsty master, there were they also. <laughs> the plant and Jemima. Will you have enough? I don't know if I can stretch one small chicken, but as long as the water's running, we'll have soup enough. Lobby. <laughs> Will you take Kay upstairs, Marshal, like goo off her face and give her a good... And one question they never answered. When the Negro woman was taking care of the white woman's kids, who was taking care of hers? They did all kinds of odd jobs around the picture, like walking horses. When they weren't walking the horses, they were out back playing craps, of course. Recreation. They met people at the station for their masters. Is, uh, is, uh, you folks, uh... We come all the way from Ireland. Mr. Milford's expecting us. Mr. Milford. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you is which I'm looking for. I'm Mr. Milford's boy. His boy, you say? Yes, sir. Murphy's the name, sir. Did you say Murphy? Yes, Miss Murphy. They call me Walking Murphy. Walking Murphy? Yes, sir. Most of us Murphys down here just sit. I walk. They make wonderful servants, all kinds in pictures. Dumb but loyal. Yeah. Jack, isn't it a beautiful night? I just love parties, don't you? I beg your pardon? Thank you kindly. Yes? Hello? Oh, this is the Barry John resident. Come on, Mona, and get you ready, ready. And things were getting pretty tough during the 30s. And a good thing for a lot of black actors was that they made a movie called The Green Pastures with, like they say, a cast of thousands. It gave a lot of people work, but it had all the old stereotyped characters. It was clever and funny and all black. But it was a white man's picture. I'm the Indian. Henry, you sure got the prettiest wings. Oh, they just my old ones. Cigars, gentlemen, cigars. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Cigars, gentlemen, cigars. Oh, Lord, the smoke costs is empty. Oh, Lord, let me get them groceries. Oh, Lord, let me see that little six. Where? Come on, you're going to feed me or not? Hey! Why, well, you just a little boy. Gambling and sinning and chewing tobacco like you was your own pappy. And you've been drinking Sunny Kick Mammy wine, too. You gamblers ought to be ashamed of yourself leading this boy to sin. Well, he's the best crap shooter in town. You find my mammy, do more than I can. While Hollywood was turning out films, radio came along and decided to get in on it, too. Two white fellows from Chicago invented two black characters they named Amos and Andy. They played their parts on the radio for 30 years. This is them doing their bit. Well, Brother Crawford looks pretty good since he's been here at Palm Springs, don't he? Yeah, looks like his wife done beat him on When radio moved over to let television in, Amos and Andy went with it. These two white cats couldn't play Amos and Andy where you could see them, so what they did was they had a black cast. The cast was different, but the stereotypes were the ones that the white people had come to know and love. They were shady characters with money. Well, I got the books right here, and they're open to each and every brother complete inspection. Get your hands off of that thing there. <laughs> So you want to see the financial books, huh? Yeah. Well, there he is. There he is. You done see them. Uh, the meeting's adjourned. 
Neither they were still them. slow and lazy. Are you sure they are not here? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, they told me so themselves. <laughs> Have them report to our office right away. I sure tell them, all right. I got a second <laughs> They had trouble with the English language. Misused words a lot. Ah, ah, ah. And Mr. Brown, my new secretary here, ain't gonna have no time for no extra cuticle activities. And I'm telling you now, as long as you have that secretary in your office, I'm going to work as a secretary myself. Oh, give me an old tomato, huh? <laughs> well, I put my foot down. They had secretary. trouble with women. <laughs> And it was always the women who were dominant. Come on, Herman. Mostly black actors aren't playing the old stereotypes anymore. There are people who say they're playing a new stereotype. Sidney Poitier is always helping some little old ladies across the street, whether they want to go or not. The black people in this country got a bum deal for a long while. And it won't hurt much if uh, we see a little of that now and then. Stanley Kramer has let us use some scenes from Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. You look at these and remember Birth of a Nation. This is the opening scene when Katherine Hutton is bringing Sydney home for the first time. This is Dr. Prentice. John, Miss Matilda Binks. Pleased to meet you, Miss Binks. I've certainly heard a great deal about you. Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy are the girl's parents. Oh, God, he's right. She's 23 years old, and the way she is is just exactly the way we brought her up to be. We answered her question. She listened to our answers. We told her it was wrong to believe that the white people were somehow essentially superior to the black people, or the brown or the red or the yellow ones, for that matter. People who thought that way were wrong to think that way. Sometimes hateful, usually stupid, but always, always wrong. That's what we said. And when we said it, we did not add, but don't ever fall in love with a colored man. Sidney tells it like it is to his old man. You and your whole lousy generation believes the way it was for you is the way it's got to be. And not until your whole generation has lain down and died will the dead weight of you be off our backs. You understand, you've got to get off my back. Dad, you're my father. I'm your son. I love you. I always have, and I always will. But you think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. By the time the world of movies and the world of education get into the streets of black America, some strange things happen. Because what history and the movies have told the black man is that he's nobody unless he joins the white world. The white world only comes into the black ghetto by messenger. The message used to read, black is nothing, white is beautiful. For this reason, a lot of black people have spent their lives trying to be white. For instance, hair. Some people still call straight hair good hair because it looks like white hair. Kinky hair is bad hair. The man on the right is having his hair cut naturally. The man on the left is having a process. What the barber is doing is applying harsh chemicals to his head so he'll have straight hair like all those movie stars have. It's a painful long job that costs about $6 and has to be looked after every couple of weeks. These days, many young black men find the whole process demeaning. It's going out of fashion, even in the ghetto. 
It takes pain to become like a white man, and more pain when you know you can't make it. For a while, it seemed to the black community that the way to escape was to get as rich as possible and look as white as possible. And as affluence came to some black people, all the lessons of history and all the lessons of the movie seemed to be succeed on the white man's terms. So, the middle-class Negro took the white man's dreams and tried to make them his. Today, many middle-class Negroes have the education and the money to provide themselves with all the white man's dreams but one, universal social acceptability. He has not yet been able to join, in any normal or casual way, the white man's affluent society, so he has his own. The white man's attitudes still exclude the black man and the black woman. There's a fallacy in this country that says that any man by his merits can make it. That is not true. Do not believe that. It is not true. Because any man in this society cannot make it. That's where the whole fallacy is. The white man keeps saying to you, if you just stop being black, if you just stop shooting your, your, your people on Saturday night, if you just stop talking Negro dialect, if you clean yourself up, get yourself a job, you're going to make it in this society. It's not true. I know for myself, I have a master's degree in social work, and I know that people won't accept me. And I was an honor student, and I know I can make it. They won't accept me. They don't discriminate against me because I'm a Christian. They're discriminating against me because I'm black. The message down here is coming in stronger. It's be yourself, be black. The new generation of black young Americans is asserting itself in a new and possibly disturbing way. Many black Americans are giving up on American society. If you can't wash white, even if you have the money, if you can't wash white because you are basically black, what you do is react, sometimes radically. Here is a measure of the reaction to white is beautiful. This is a storefront school in Philadelphia. The children are being given a black preparation before they enter the city's schools. They're not especially gifted children, they're just from the neighborhood. One black man named John Churchill put it all together and financed it himself. Right? You understand that? Yeah, yeah. All right. A number is a concept of quantity or an amount. That is wrong. No! No! A number is a concept of quantity or an amount. That is dead wrong. He's not only teaching new math to children whose ages range from 17 months to five years, He's decided to give them the emotional armor they need to protect themselves against the education they're sure to receive when they start kindergarten. Anybody tells you something wrong, are you going to do it? No! Um, what do you want, Janelle? I want freedom. When do you want it? I want my freedom now. No, you have to wait till next week, Janelle. You can't have it now. Can you, 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 can you wait till next week? Yes. Okay. Sit down. All right, young man, stand up. When do you want your freedom, young man? I want freedom now. You can wait till next week, though, can't you? No. Michael, you just have to wait till next week. You can't have it now. Are you willing to wait till next week? No. Suppose I said that um, you have to wait till next week. Now, you're going to wait till next week, aren't you? No. How are you going to get your freedom? I will use any means necessary to get my freedom. Any means necessary? Yes. You know, you know all right, sit down. Young man, what is your name? My name is Eric Houston. Levante. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. What is freedom? Freedom is black power. What is black power? Black power is... Do you know what black power is? No. Well, then you should never use, you never, should never make any statements if you don't know what they mean. I'm sorry, I don't know. All right. Um, how old are you, young man? I am four years old. 
You're not poor, Aaron. Now you tell me your right age. How old are you? How old are you? I'm four years old. Are you sure you're four? Yes. You're going to let me turn you around and tell you you're some other age? You're six years old, Eric. No. I can't hear you, Eric. No! Are you being frightened by me? No! I'm a teacher. I said you're six. I am four years old. All right, then. You stand up for it, then. You shouldn't be weak. You stand up and say it. You ought to scream it in my face if I try to tell you different. Right? Yes. Have a seat. Stand up, young man. Are you a Negro, Travis? No. Are you a flunky, Travis? No. What are you? I am black and beautiful. And what else are you? Are you a boy? No. What are you? I'm a man. What kind of man? Black and beautiful man. Well, what kind? Are you an old man or a young man? Young man. Very good. Very good. Are you going to let somebody just make, make you a boy? No. All right. Suppose I tell you something wrong, Travis. Are you going to do it? Yes. You're going to do something if I tell you when it's wrong? No. Have a seat, young man. Eric, you're going to be reasonable, aren't you? No. Come here. Here you are, fine young man, right? Yeah. Are you going to be scared of me? No. Are you going to be scared of some president of the United States? No. Some mayor? No. Some policeman? No. All right. You're a Negro. Yes! You're a Negro, Eric. No. Somebody passed me my stick. I said you're a Negro, boy. No. You're getting mighty soft. You're a Negro. No. Very good. All right, sit down. Uh, you, young man, you come here. Your nationality is American Negro. Yes. No. Your nation... Now look, don't play with me. You're a Negro. No. I am your teacher. You are a Negro. No. Suppose I threatened to beat you, what would you say? Aren't you a Negro now? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Suppose I had some money in my pocket. Suppose I gave you a dollar to say that you're an American Negro. This is money now. Money talks. Money talks. This dollar. And if you don't say it, you don't get it. You're an American Negro, aren't you? No. You won't have any money. You know you need money, don't you? Yeah. You need money to live, don't you? Yeah. All right. All you have to say, Leon, is that you're an American Negro. Aren't you an American Negro? Are you an American Negro? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What's your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Very good, man. Keep it up. Go sit down. You had to think about that a minute, didn't you? Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Good. All right. What I did is what people are going to do to you in different ways when you get out of the school. They're not going to just come right up to you and give you a dollar or say, if you say that you're an Afro, if you say you're an American Negro, I'll give you a dollar. But they're going to be very nice to you, some of them, and they're going to try to, you know, get you not to love black people. They're going to try to get you to, you know, be something other than you are. They're going to try to make you, make it seem as though you're different from the masses of black people. And they want you to be, go away. And I'll tell you, I'll give you special things if you just come along with me and do what I say. But you must reject that. Now, you know what that means? That means you're not going to have the money you'd like to have. And money is not important. We need money. We, you know, we have to buy things with it. But money is not the thing that we're living for. The only thing that makes a person worth living is being a man and being a woman. Being strong in character, being straight, telling the truth, and living in the truth and doing the right thing. You understand that? So no matter what happens, I want you all to always tell the what? 
You may not get the marks you're supposed to get in school. You may be doing the work, but because the teacher doesn't like your attitude, and she'll always tell you, I don't like your attitude. Because you're independent, but you're not going to school for grades. You're going for what? Yeah. All right, and what kind of people are, is everybody in this room going to be? Tell me the kind of people you're going to be. Black and blue. What else? You're already there. Uh, what are you going to be? Uh, you're going to be stupid? No. What kind of people are you going to be? Excellent. You're going to be excellent. And what else? Yes, ma'am. And strong. And strong. And what else? And good. And good. And what else? A genius. At, and a genius. And what else? I'm looking for another word. All of you are geniuses right now, and you'll be better than that. What else? I'm looking for a word that begins with a B. Br brilliant. Brilliant. And brilliant really means to shine. And all of you will shine. All of you are really going to be brilliant. Good enough. All right. How does everybody feel now? Bye. You ready to get ready for lunch? Yeah! Who's hungry? Well, it's kind of like brainwashing. Or is it? I mean, can you blame us for overcompensating? I mean, when you take the way black history got lost, stolen, or strayed, when you think about the kids drawing themselves without faces, and when you remember the fine actors who had to play baboons to make a buck, I guess you, you got to give us a sin of pride. Pride. Hubris in the original Greek. It's 300 years we've been in this American melting pot, and we haven't been able to melt in yet. And that's a long wait. Listen, we've been trying all kinds of parts to make the American scene. We've been trying to play it straight and white. But it's been just bit parts. Now, from now on, we're going to play it black and American, because we're proud of both. Hubris. I'm Bill Cosby, and you take care of yourself. All right. What is a set? A set is a collection of objects. What is a subset? A subset is part of a set. What is a member? A member is one you have a set. What, in terms of set comparison, does larger mean? I'm mean, everybody together. I'm going to ask you all a question. Let's see if you can do it. All right. What is arithmetic? Arithmetic is not a number. What is a number? A member. What is, uh, in terms of set comparison, what does larger mean? Larger means a set that has more members in In terms of set comparison, what does smaller mean? Smaller means a set that has less members All right. All right. Now, quickly, look up on the board, relax, but think very quickly. You understand? Yes. All right. In terms of set comparison, we want to compare two sets, and you, I want you to tell me which is larger. The first time. You take care of yourself. <laughs>